Hello, everyone, and welcome to week five of Tessie's retreat. We are halfway through, guys. Isn't that amazing? Time flies. You know, looking at it in the perspective of the 4K calendar that we talked about last week, you know, there's already five boxes filled with us spending time together. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. And looking at the perspective of, of, uh, of my son, Theodor, right? That's a month and one week that we have spent together and he's only 11 months. So it's kind of like 10% of his life that we have already gone through within this month and week. Isn't that incredible? So there you go. Just thought I mentioned this because time is our most valuable commodity, time and health. And so spend it right. Spend it doing the things you love with the people you love. And um, yeah, keep learning. And that's why we're all here. Disclaimer as every week, I'm not a licensed physician, nor am I a qualified coach. This is part of a 10-week uh, retreat that I have organized for all of us, people coming from YouTube, people joining here live, people joining offline one-on-one -on -one with me. It's part of a coursework that I'm doing for my PhD in integrative medicine with Quantum University in the US. Um, if uh, these are pure suggestions, of course, over the last four, five weeks now, all suggestions. Um, and if you want to go ahead with some and don't feel secure about it, please consult a professional and an expert. Always seek other advice. And again, as last week and the weeks before, if you feel unwell, please go and seek help. There's nothing I can do about that. Um, it's definitely not online. <laughs> so uh, by being here, by listening to this on YouTube now and over the last weeks as well, and joining 101 and sending comments and sharing it, you understand this and you agree with this. Perfect. So. We are on week five, and today we talk about anxiety and stress. We all experience anxiety and stress in our own ways. It's something I have been telling people when they told me about my burnout, when, when they asked me about it. They said, how does it feel like? You know, I, I don't know if I have a burnout. I don't know how I feel about it. And I said, well, anxiety and stress is like a fingerprint. It's like your earlobe. It's so unique to you. There's things I can suggest. There's things I have done to help myself and to ease my worry and my stress and my anxiety that have worked for me. But that does not always say that it will work for you in the way it did for me. It's something you can try. And there's always so many million other things you can try after while, have learned, while you have learned this. Because from learning about something, you automatically create your fine-tuned receptors open you become open-minded and automatically you see new things that can um, be added to this new field of um, of skill that you are gaining and that I find really fascinating so as every week I have a little presentation that I will pop up for you one second and I hope I'm faster today than last week uh, the week before, but I think I am. I think I'm getting better. Okay. <clears throat> there. Okay, amazing. So now I do this. That is so funny because in my head, I finished the presentation, but I actually didn't. So there's a few slides and then we don't need the slides really actually, but uh, not today, but we're gonna use what I have. There you go, share screen. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna go ahead. So. Voila, can you see what is written there? Perfect, thank you, Anita. <clears throat> so, week five, anxiety and stress. 
Again, I'm not a licensed practitioner. This is part of a 10 week course for my PhD. Um, I thought I start with something I have learned because of my dear husband and something that is really, really important actually when talking about uh, anxiety and stress because it is something that where you can actually measure how stressed you are. And I thought that was really interesting. So the outline will be, we will talk about HRV, which is heart rate variability. We will go into detail really much uh, in the next slide. We talk about stress, anxiety, exercises, and Q&A today. So HRV, also known as heart rate variability. This, uh, the information I will be sharing with you is from clevelandclinic.org. As you know, I like to sit on the giant shoulders of experts, people knowing these things better than I do. And that's why I chose Cleveland Clinic for the heart rate variability theory, because I read a few texts and their text is really, it's really thorough. It's very um, well explained and it has really incredible insights. And that's why I chose this. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Heart rate variability is where the amount of time between heartbeats fluctuates slightly. Even though these fluctuations are undetected, except with specialized devices, they can still indicate current or future health problems, including heart conditions and, which is relevant to this course, mental health issues like anxiety and depression. What is heart rate variability? So as I said, heart rate variability is where the amount of time between your heartbeats fluctuates slightly. These variations are extremely small, adding or subtracting a fraction of a second between beats. These fluctuations are undetected, as I said, except with specialist devices. While heart rate variability may be present in healthy individuals, it can still indicate the presence of health problems, including heart conditions and mental health issues. Is heart rate variability like an arith arrhythmia, which is kind of like a heart uh, vibration? Heart rate variability is a normal occurrence and it isn't an arrhythmia on its own. The normal beating of your heart is called sinus rhythm. When your heart is beating normally, but the variability between heart rate is greater than 0 0.12 seconds, this is called sinus arrhythmia. Heart rate variability can sometimes meet the criteria for sinus arrhythmia. Sinus arrhythmia is usually due to breathing. This is called respiratory sinus arrhythmia, which is part of a normal reflex of your heart and circulatory system. However, when sinus arrhythmia isn't caused by breathing, it may be a sign of another heart problem that does need assessment by a healthcare provider. So how does heart rate variability really work, right? That's something I asked my husband as well. And while I was pregnant, actually, my heart rate variability was really, like my rates are normally between, let's say 35 and 45. And um, while I was pregnant, they were between 15 and 19. So the, the, the gaps between the different heartbeats was super small. And that is because my body was in hyperdrive, right? It was building a human. So, um, so I think with that example, you understand a little bit what I, what I want to tell you here. So that rate changes depending on what you're doing at the time. Slower heart rates happen when you're resting or relaxed, meditating. And faster heart rates happen when you're active, stressed. That's important for us today or when you're in danger. There is a variability in your heart rate based on the needs of your body and your respiratory patterns. Certain medications and medical devices such as peacemakers can also affect your heart rate variability. Your heart rate variability also tends to decrease normally as you get older. Whether you're awake or asleep, calm or stressed, your heart has to be able to react to changes in your life and surroundings but it doesn't know when to react on its own. So it relies on another body system for help. So now we come into the, the flight or flight, fight or flight mode. 
the parasympathetic versus sympathetic branches and heart rate variability. Your brain and nervous system support your heart. Your senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch feed information to your brain about everything around you. Your brain has a direct line to your heart, telling your heart when it needs to speed up and work harder. This direct line to your heart is your automatic, also pronounced autonomic nervic system. This is part of your brain and the set of nerves that operate without you thinking of them, even when you're asleep. It's divided into two main parts, your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system. In general, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system work like so. Sympathetic, this is where your fight or flight response comes from, you know, like kind of like in olden times, the lion is attacking you, right? This is like, you need to run, you're in danger. Um, it manages increase in the heart rate and blood pressure in emergency situations. That is also when your uh, digestive system slows down. So you're not digesting. Your body is not because when we're, digest when we're digesting, you can get tired, right? And so when you're in a fight or flight, often your stomach, well, your whole system there slows down. So if you need to do something really stressful, try not to eat too much before just because, you know, then they say it literally, it literally is stuck in your stomach like a stone, right? So um, if you're really stressed, try to be gentle on what you eat as well. Parasympathetic, this helps balance out the sympathetic nervous system and controls the natural relaxation process responses, especially after you've been in fight or flight mode. It controls slowing your heart rate and blood pressure, among other things, especially when you're taking it easy. Here's an example of how these two parts of your nervous system work together. If you think you're in danger or you get scared, or startle, or if you're anxious about something, your parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and starts the fight or flight response. Your body releases adrenaline so you can react faster. Your heart rate goes up just in case your muscles need more blood and oxygen because of physical activity. Once the situation that put you into fight or flight is over, your parasympathetic nervous system takes the lead. It tells your heart rate to slow back down and lowers your blood pressure. It also tells various systems of your body to relax and go back to how they normally work. Why is heart rate variability a good thing? Your body has many systems and features that let it adapt to where you are and what you're doing. Your heart rate variability reflects how adaptable your body can be. If your heart rate variability, if your heart rate, uh, your heart rate is high, this is usually evidence that your body can adapt to many kinds of changes. People with high heart rate variability are usually less stressed and happier. My husband, his numbers are insane. And I always thought that it was because he's a bigger guy, right? And actually, he is really, he's, he's the piece himself, you know, he's, is it the Swiss people with the mountains? Not sure, but he's just always in a good mood, right? Just relaxed. In general, low heart rate variability is considered a sign of current or future health problems because it shows your body is less resilient and struggles to handle changing situations. So as I said, for me, while I was pregnant, my HRV was quite low. And um, when we talked to the doctors about that as well, to my gynecologist, at first they were like, wait, what? What are you talking about? Why? Why is that relevant, right? And we were like, well, you know, I'm measuring my sleeve and it's, I'm not wearing it now. I need to get it to show you, but it's, it's an aura ring. And I will explain to you later what that is, but that measures your sleep and it measures your heart rate variability. Aura, I mentioned it already last week. It's O-U-R-A, Aura. And it's a really fantastic device. My husband does not take it off. I, I normally as well, not just today somehow, um, but it is really, really good. I even take it to the shower. You charge it once a week. It's great. It's like that little ingredient. Let me get it for you. One second. One second. I on I um let me just take this away so you can actually talk to each other a little bit while I'm coming back. One second.
and coming back. I brought the other things as well that I want to show you today. But that's not relevant now. So the ring actually looks like this. So it is a tiny ring. I can't hear you, Anita. You're muted. You can see inside the receptors. See? It has all of these measuring tools inside. It's super it light. Excuse me? What's it called again? O-U-R-A. Aura ring. If you Google it, it pops up straight away. You have it as well in other colors than black. And when you order it, they actually send you a measuring kit for your fingers before you get the real one so you can measure it. I normally wear it in the middle. So does my husband, but you can really wear it on any finger you want. My dad wears it on his thumb. And my parents now that I gave, I gave it to them for Christmas, they're just like, oh my God, this is great. Ah, Jessica, she says she has it in gold. Um, what is it? Cartier has now one as well that they're doing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's everywhere and it's a really cool device actually. So check it out. Um, so as I said, you know, people struggle more, they have generally, they struggle more and they have problems adapting to changing situations. If you, um, if your heart rate variability is a bit lower, this is also more common in people who have higher resting heart rate, which also is measured with the aura ring, your resting heart rate, just everything you need to know about your sleep and your heart will be on there, which I think is really cool. That's because when your heart is beating faster, there's less time between the beats, reducing the opportunity for variability. This is often the case with conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart arrhythmia, asthma, anxiety, and depression. Let me just see. There you go. Then how is your heart rate variability measured? The variance in your heart rate are very small. So it takes specialized equipment, as I said before, devices to detect that. Modern technology has reached a point where non-medical devices that can track heart rate variability are affordable and easy to find. In a medical setting, of course, electrocardiogram, you know, we all know that where they put these stickers on you and then the EKG, right? And where they measure you. Uh, Jessica, my cousin who is on the call, she knows really well about all of that, um, is usually to detect the heart rate variability. This device, um, there's others that you can do, but I think, and there's some you take home as well from the hospital where they put them on for 24 hours and you have like a little computer on the side, things like that. I have done that. I have been there, um, all great stuff as well. But if you want, and if you can, and if you can afford it, but they are, because they are a little bit expensive as well, um, try and get Aura Ring. This is not a publicity. I'm not paid for this. I'm just telling you what I like and what I use. And I have been using this for years now and it is really great. So I continue. So when to call the doctor, what's a good heart rate variability number, right? And that's why I like this article so much because they really are so thorough. Unfortunately, heart rate variability is difficult to interpret it. Variability also decreases as you age and variability that's normal in one person may not be normal for someone else. Like, for example, my mom, hers is very low, but hers has always been low. And she is, she tells me she's all relaxed and everything. So it really depends on your body. Your healthcare provider or specialist is the best person you can go to to understand really about heart rate variability. Go to a cardiolog, someone who is a specialist in heart, um, because they will be the best person. So um, they have a section here, which I added as well to my talk because I really like it. Frequently asked questions. Can I improve my heart rate variability? Of course, there are a few different ways that you can improve your heart rate variability. Some may involve improving your physical condition. Others include taking care of your mental health. And that is what we are here to do, right? Here are a few general things you can do. Take care of your body. Regular exercise and a healthy diet improve your overall health, especially the condition of your heart. And this can help improve your variability. What I did as well is that when you go to the spa in London, they have a great one um, um, next to Notting Hill. It looks a bit grotty there, but it is quite amazing. Um, for the people in London now, I can send it to you directly. Um, they have in Zurich as well, at, uh, in the Dolder here. 
do the hot cold thing if you can. It's really great because it stresses your heart a little bit because your body needs to pump more blood here and there, but it also kind of conditions it. It works with it, right? Do not do that if you have already a heart problem. Of course, this is just a suggestion. I don't want you to get in trouble, but it worked for me and it really helped me to get my anxiety under control when I was anxious as well. Because when you, uh, with the shower, for example, as we talked in week two, to take that meditative shower, what would be great as well, what I do as well, and especially now with the heat outside, take cold showers. It's amazing. The Kneipp circuit, exactly, exactly. Um, take care of your mind. Your mental health is a vital part of your heart rate variability. Reducing and managing your stress level can improve your heart rate variability. If you have mental health concerns, anxiety or depression, managing these can make a huge difference. One method to help improve heart rate variability is called biofeedback training. And I have been doing that as well with Quantum University. By controlling your breathing through biofeedback training, you can improve your heart rate variability. We have as well next week, if I'm not mistaken, where is it now? Ah, oh, I left it downstairs, my booklet. Next week, we have uh, briefing, breath work. So we will be talking about all of this and breath work, biofeedback um, training and so on. There's also evidence to show that biofeedback training can help improve your levels of stress and anxiety. So is my heart rate variability something that should make me worry? In general, an abnormal heart rate variability isn't something that will cause a medical emergency, they say. But it can be a sign of current health problems or issues down the road. It is also important to remember that most consumer level devices that heart track heart rate variability are not as sensitive as an EKG. It is a good guideline, but it will never replace a hospital visit, guys. It is important to keep in mind that your heart rhythm is incredibly complex. While you can find devices and apps, as I mentioned, that track your heart rate variability, a healthcare provider, as I said before, is most qualified. So let's, yes, I know, Tokyo, there's no more presentation because the rest, I did it in my brain, but I didn't add it here, but that's fine because the things we're talking about is really a lot of theory and it's nice theory. I really like this one. We are going over now to stress, which I think is a really, really, really important topic talking about all of this. And then we go over to anxiety specifically. The information I'm sharing with you now that I'm reading to you is retrieved by verywell.com. And the article is written by Brianna Gilmartin. I read again, many, many articles and I use a lot as well for the university. And this one I liked because it is really thorough again. <laughs> I'm glad you like it, okay. So what is stress, right? Everyone has different definitions. Everyone feels it different. Even when you go online, definitions of stress, they kind of are the same, but they all are different, right? So I use this one. Stress can be defined as any type of change that causes physical, emotional, or psychological strain. Stress is your body's response to anything that requires attention or action. Everyone experiencing stress to some degree, as I mentioned before, right? Fingerprint and earlobes, we are all very different. The way you respond to stress, however, makes a big difference to your overall well-being. Sometimes the best way to manage your stress involves changing your situation, if you can, of course. At other times, the best strategy involves changing the way you respond to situations, as we talked about it in week one, two, and three. Developing a clear understanding of how stress impacts your physical and mental health is important. It is also important to recognize how your mental and physical health affects your stress level. So let me tell you a bit about the science. Stress can be short-term or long-term. Both can lead to a variety of symptoms, but chronic stress can take a serious tool on your body over time and have long-lasting health effects. Some common signs of stress include change of moods, clammy or sweaty palms. I actually get really, really cold hands when I start to get a bit stressed. Decreased sex drive, diarrhea, difficult sleeping, digestive problems. They say as well, you know, your brain is the, your, your, your gut is the brain of your body, right? 
dizziness, feeling anxious, frequent sickness, grinding teeth, headaches, low energy, muscle tension, especially in the neck and shoulders, because as we talked about last week, you pull them up, right? There's always, you know, and, and I find that really fascinating. I don't know about you guys, but when I realize that I do it, it's actually an effort to keep them up. So why is it hard for me to make the effort to keep them down when it's so natural to keep them up, right? Funny, isn't it? I have no answers to that, but uh, is, it, is it because I'm in use of it? But yeah, if you notice it, just as I told to, talked to you last week, make a little reminder on your phone, maybe every half an hour or something like that, like a little ring to check on your posture and just really deliberately always put your shoulders down. And, you know, as you practice this, it will become a new routine and your body will automatically start to do the opposite instead of up, that it actually becomes easier and more normal for your body to pull it down instead of pulling it up. Both are, both are an effort for your body. So make it the right effort, right? Because no one is cutting off your head and we're not running away from lions. So um, I think that's a good exercise and a good mindfulness practice as well, as we talked about in week two. Physical aches and pain, racing heartbeat and trembling. Trembling is a really interesting one as well, because trembling is really um, the body, you know, people say it, well, it actually shakes out the stress, doesn't it? And when I'm standing on stage, I often have my legs shaken and people don't notice it or I feel it, but it is really, yeah, for me, it is that stress, but I also have it when I'm not stressed, when I'm just standing there and talking to people. And that's when I realize, okay, I'm either really stressed internally, subconsciously, also, when you're trembling, that is also a sign that you're dehydrated. Drink water. Um, Anita is saying, I think taking a, a coup of slow breaths helps you say, yes, it does. Deep breaths, like you have on your Apple Watch, as we talked in week one, there's that little function where you can for like a minute or so. The watch breathes with you and it vibrates when you need to breathe in and it, and it vibrates differently when you need to go out. Exactly, Anita. Deep in deep out, little breaks, just a minute or two, even, you know, just a minute makes a huge difference. Right, Anita? I like your headband right away. We're the headband girls today. Teamwork. Hello. Little flowers. Very nice. Um, common symptoms of too much stress. Identifying stress then. Stress is not always easy to recognize, but there are some ways to identify some signs that you might be experiencing too much pressure. Sometimes stress can come from an obvious source, but sometimes even small daily stress for work, family, friends, school, whatever it is, can take a toll on your mind. If you think stress might be affecting you, there are a few things you can watch for. Psychological signs such as difficulty concentrating, worrying, anxiety, and trouble remembering. Emotional signs such as being angry, irritated, moody, or frustrated. Physical signs such as high blood pressure, changes in weight, frequent colds or infections, and changes in the menstrual cycle and lipido, as I talked to you before. Behavioral signs such as poor self-care, not having time for the things you enjoy, or relying on drugs or alcohol to cope. Causes. There are many ways of causes to give you stress, right? Finances, relationships, parenting, day-to-day -day inconveniences, and so on. Stress can trigger the body's response to a perceived threat or danger, known as the fight or flight response, as we said before. During this reaction, certain hormones like adrenaline and cortisol, which is important, we have not talked about cortisols yet, are released. This speeds up the heart rate, slows digestion, as I mentioned before, shuns blood flow to major muscle groups and changes various other autonomic nervous functions, giving the body a burst of energy and strength to run away, right? Originally named for its ability to enable us to physically fight or run ahead when faced with danger, the fight or flight response is now activated in situations where neither response is appropriate, like in traffic or doing a stressful day at work. When the perceived threat is gone, systems are designed to return to normal function, as we said before, via the relaxation response, right? Parasympathetic nervous system. But in cases of chronic stress, guys, the relaxation response doesn't occur often enough. And being in a near constant state fight, 
or flight, fight or flight, can cause damage to the body. Stress can also lead to unhealthy habits, right? As I said before, you know, some people drink, some people take drugs, whatever it is to cope, right? Um, people cope with stress by eating too much, smoking. You know, I am one that when I'm stressed, like really annoyed and stressed, sometimes then I smoke as well. And I know it's not a really good thing, but it kind of like makes me feel better, even though I know it's actually really rubbish for you and for your body, right? So that is how I cope when I'm really, uh, um, I don't drink alcohol anymore, but um, yeah, the smoking sometimes in the evening when baby is in bed and had a really rough day, I still do. And yeah, it's not a good thing. So um, I, I know what I need to work on. Do you know what you need to work on? Types of stress then. I thought that was really amazing that she put that in the article because I learned a lot from this. So not all types of stress are harmful or even negative. Some of the different types of stress that you might experience include acute stress, so really strong. Acute stress is a very short-term type of stress that can either be positive or more distressing. This is the type of stress we most often encounter in day-to-day -day life. Chronic stress, as I mentioned before, chronic stress is that seems never-ending and inescapable, like the stress of a bad marriage or an extremely taxing ja job Chronic stress can also stem from traumatic experience and childhood trauma. Episodic acute stress, so episodic, so um, sometimes. Acute stress is acute stress that seems to run rampant and be a way of life, creating a life of ongoing distress. And EU stress, EU stress, so EU stress is fun and exciting. It's known as a positive type of stress that can keep you energized is associated with surges of adrenaline, such as when you are skiing or racing to meet a deadline. Impact of stress then. The connection between your mind and body is apparent when you examine the impact stress has on your life. Feeling stressed out over a relationship, money, or your living situation can create physical health issues. The inverse is also true. Health problems, whether you're dealing with high blood pressure or you have diabetes, will also affect your stress levels and your mental health. When your brain experiences high stress, high degrees of stress, your body reacts accordingly. Stress influence conditions, which I think is really important as well. Diabetes, hair loss, heart diseases, hyperthyroidism, so your thyroid, obesity, sexual dysfunction, tooth and gum disease, and ulcers. Why? Because the ulcers, for example, when you're really stressed, your nervous system gets a hit. When your nervous system gets a hit, like when I'm really, really stressed, like after or while doing my whole divorce, when I was a litigant in person in court, defending myself and the rights for my children against two of the biggest law firms in the UK, I had ulcers which came on my gums. And I talked to the doctor about it because they burn, right? It's very unpleasant. And the doctor said to me, Tessie, first, you're exhausted. Secondly, because you're exhausted and stressed, like there's no tomorrow, your body has all of, well, it needs to choose really, right? What it spends its time on, on defending and looking after and so on. And yeah, I got ulcers from it on the tongue as well on the side. And um, yeah, meditation helped me a lot to get that away. Um, yeah, so if you experience any of these conditions, um, go and see a doctor and see if maybe stress is related to this. And who knows, maybe it goes away, right? I'm not saying it can, but it, but, but it can as well. So you never know, right? Treatment. Stress is not a distinct medical diagnosis and there's no single specific treatment for it. Treatment for stress focuses on changing the situation, developing stress coping skills, implementing relaxation techniques and treating symptoms or conditions that may have been caused by chronic stress. Some interventions that may be helpful include therapy, medication and complementary and alternative medicine which is kind of like herbs and other things uh, for the alternative side and meditation. 
Alternatives are also meditation, acupuncture, osteopathy, all of these things. And for London, there's a really good one, Fred Roscoe practice in, um, in uh, by Harrods, Knightsbridge. Voila, he is really amazing. He is really incredible. And he helped me a lot when I was very, very ill. And he also uh, was looking after my boys, you know, stressed with school and everything. And kind of like um, got their body and their nervous system to come down a little bit, which I think is amazing. So other things are psychotherapy. Some forms of therapy that may be particularly helpful in addressing symptoms of stress include cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. There's also some apps you can actually on Apple um, and also Android where you can have CBT very affordably with a therapist online through the app. Check it out. I have tried it. And it was great. Or because some psychologists are really expensive when you go. It's like 120 pounds. Here in Switzerland, even more an hour, right? Or let's say even 80 pounds is a lot of money, right? When you go for the app, and I tried it as well, and that was really great. Um, I had a psychologist and I was talking to her, it was a woman at that time, on the phone. We had our weekly sessions and it was 45 pounds for 50 minutes, which I think is absolutely fine. And she was great. She helped me really, uh, you know, with advice and talking therapy and CBT. And, you know, we had also video so we could have the camera or not the camera. And it's great. So there's a lot of apps there. There's a lot of resources, not just for. Um, I did not enjoy CBT. Yeah, it's not it's not for everyone. OK, OK. Um, it really is not. I know some people where it didn't work at all, actually. So it really, um, it really is what works for you, right? What helped me as well a lot was RTMS therapy. RTMS therapy, um, Google it. And London, I know they do it in Holly Street, um, which is a electric magnetic coil that they put on your brain. Depression is, um, if I remember well, on your left side and anxiety on your right side. I had it on the right side because of my anxiety panic attacks. And it kind of like gives electric pulsations on a specific part of your of your skull, um, which has been measured before and assessed and everything by an expert. And uh, to kind of like help regrow these neurological pathways through electric stimulation that have been lost because of anxiety and stress and things like that. So RTMS therapy has worked for me really well. Um, the sad thing is that um, it's quite expensive still. And I find it a scandal because I think everyone should be able to, to access this. I don't know about how it is now, but when I did it, it was really expensive. Yes, my health insurance covered some, but almost nothing. And it's, yeah, I think it should be made more affordable for everyone, um, especially young people when they go through this. Because young people, you know, they're often students. And not everyone can afford this, right? You have a job, then you go studying and everything. And also parents, you know, not every parent have that money ready or health insurance for that. You know, look in the US, not everyone has health insurance. Also in the UK, not everyone has uh, supplement health insurance. They have the NHS and the NHS will not or very, very unlikely pay for this. If they do, great, but I would be surprised. Um, Yes, as Anita says, you know, also listening services or a good friend who will just listen. Internalizing emotions is a bleeding ground for stress. It is talk about it. All right. As I talked to you about it in week one, two, and two about journaling in the morning, just have a journal next to the bed and no phone. The phone should be out of the bed as we talked in week three, but um, have a journal instead, a piece of paper, whatever. And as soon as you wake up, just sit on your bed and just write down anything exactly, and it's free, anything that just comes to your mind, just anything, any rubbish, even things like sometimes I write down, I really don't want to do this. This sucks. This is not interesting. Um, I have nothing to say. What should I think? Hmm, how is the weather today? What should I wear? You know, whatever it is, you just let it out, just declutter. And then you will see eventually your brain is coming with what needs to come out. No, Alexander, no problem. You can come whenever you want. You know that. This is a family reunion here. So we come in and go out as we can. 
So CBD, as I said, just to finish this up, and yes, as Toki said, it didn't work for her. It doesn't work. For, it doesn't. It doesn't work for everyone. And some people can do it. Other need to find something else, right? As I said, fingerprint, earlobe. It's really what works for you. Try it. If not, try something else. There's also mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR it's called. So Google that. Medication. Medication may sometimes be prescribed to address some specific symptoms that are related to stress. Such medication may include sleep aids, antacids, antidepressants, or anti-anxiety medication, such as Xanax and so on. I am not a fan of this. Um, I have tried this when I was really desperate at the beginning when I didn't know what is happening to me and I went to see a professional and the first thing he gave me was an antidepressant and that is when I met Dr. Zamar in Harley Street in London and he I was two weeks on antidepressants and he was like Tessie you are not depressed and you're young don't take this this will really really not be good for you and um, I'm so grateful to him because um, I found all of these other alternative things I could do and that really helped me. But of course, some people only medication works. And if that works for you, I will not judge you. You do whatever works for you. And that's fine with me too. I'm just telling you today what worked for me. And I give you other alternatives and suggestions for what you could do else. But whatever works for you, I'm happy for that. Because feeling anxious and having panic attacks is not fun. And whatever makes you feel better good for you right so um but just inform yourself there's so many amazing things out there and just try something new uh, simona says it's so important to take the time just to see friends when you're stressed usually it already helps to sit down brief drink a tea i cope better with stress since i have my two dogs by the way it's true animals are amazing why do you think they there's so many therapy animals in the hospitals right and um yeah, why people at home when they have animals feel less stressed. It's it's absolutely true. And yeah, that's why as well, we were thinking about getting a dog for, I have hiccups, um, for the kids because, you know, they are in exam stress and everything else they need to deal with in their lives, right? Um, and being on social media and these things is very stressful as we talked about already as well, um, especially with Simone, who is a teacher in school with young people. And sadly, you know, you can't really take away the smartphones anymore, but there's a lot of pressure on our children that we didn't have when we were young because of social media. And I think, you know, animals are a really, really good thing um, to deal with that as well and to help you just think about something else. Simona says she recommends a Portuguese water dog with kids. Rudy says, meds definitely helped me with managing anxiety, but it took a long time to find the right, the right one. Exactly. Also the dosage, right? Because, you know, medication, they say, um, you know, is often not tested on everyone. So you have a kind of like a benchmark. I think it was, um, if I'm not mistaken, a 45-year-old white male of a certain weight and that is the benchmark a lot of medication is benched on. Um, that's why we have personalized medicine now, because a lot of medication actually is not made for a female body. We are smaller. We are more gentle, right? Our systems are different than the ones of males. Also children. Some medication are from, uh, they say, 12 and up, right? And my children, Gabriel and Noah, their physiques are very different. And, uh, you know, Noah, he's, he's, he's a bit skinnier, like I was. And Gabriel, he is, he is skinny, but he's not, you know, um, he has also a lot of muscle. And their weight is a big difference. And giving them the same medication sometimes makes me feel uncomfortable because I think it's weird, isn't it? You know, some things, poor Noah, you know, I'm thinking like it's going to knock him off, right? Um, so, yeah. Uh, I agree with you, Rudy, that the dosage is a big problem and it takes a long time to find the right one as well when you go the route of medication. So if that is the route people want to go with, you need to go be patient and also have a doctor that listens to you. That is really good advice, Rudy. Tokea, a pond full of koi and goldfish help a good deal. 
well, you know, aquarium is an amazing thing to have, you know, honestly, just sitting at a doctor's office and seeing an aquarium there chills me out, to be honest. So yes, I agree. It's a lot of work though. That's why we don't have one. I had turtles and um, fish when Gabba was born and it was great, but it was horrible getting a babysitter for fish and a turtle when you go on holiday. So yeah, we decided not to get any more here uh, for Theodore, but it's really great. And if you have them in a pond outside, they kind of take care of themselves, don't they? I think it's great. It's Eckert Thule on pain body helps a lot. Can you put um, a link, Alexandra, so I can read it out? And also walk with dogs. It's nice, just walks in general. Just get out. Get out of your house, guys. Get out. Get out of your offices during lunch break. And sit in the park and eat there. You know, just get some fresh air. Try to listen to the breeze of the wind. Or get some sun, get some vitamin D, right? It's really important. Our nature is there for that. You know, we are not made to sit in an office 12 hours a day or in the house all the time. So yeah, very important. Um, then alternative and complementary uh, medicine can be uh, acupuncture, as I mentioned, aromatherapy, massage, yoga, and meditation. <laughs> Rudy says, my dog walks are kind of stressful because there are postmen waiting around every corner, but we manage. <laughs> Uh, yeah, stargazing. I love it. That is also really great. I like just looking at stars. If you can see them in London, you can't see the stars really because there's so much light pollution that you can't see them, right? So if you can see the stars wherever you are, even in London sometimes, um, just do it. It's so nice. It is really nice, actually. That's a really good thing to say. Simon Blazer says, Eckhart Tolle is great indeed. I am just reading Le Pouvoir du Moment Présent. So the power of the, the to be in the moment. And so uh, he's a book author. Check him out. Eckhart, E-C-K-H-A-R-T, Tolle, T-O-L-L-E. There you go. Thank you, guys. So coping. Learn to recognize the signs of a burnout. High levels of stress may place you at the risk of a burnout. Burnout can leave you feeling exhausted and apathetic. Apathetic about your job. When you feel, when you sort of feel the symptoms of emotional exhaustion, it's a sign that you need to find a way to get a handle on your stress. Try to get regular exercise. Physical activity has a big impact on your brain and your body. Whether you enjoy Tai Chi or you want to begin jogging, exercise, whatever it is, reduces stress and improves many symptoms that I mentioned before. Um, take care of yourself. Incorporate regular self-care activities in your daily life is essential to stress, man to stress, to manage your stress. And it can be take a bath, go for a walk, Watch a movie. I watch Virgin River at the moment. It's like a Netflix series and I really like it, to be honest. Um, you know, whatever. Just whatever floats your boat, what you like for yourself that makes you feel good, do it. And put it in your agenda. If you say you don't have time, make time. Because if you don't make time for yourself and your body shuts down, like when I had the burnout, I was always like, I'm fine. I take a nap. And as we learned, with the sleep week four, you cannot within a few days take back what you have lost over weeks of not sleeping properly and being too stressed. It takes time. So invest in prevention and every week create meetings in your agenda, which are meeting with the most important person in my life, Aka, myself. Okay. And if anyone wants to book you in for a meeting or if anyone says, do you have time and you have that in there, don't you dare say, yes, I do. No, you don't. And I'm guilty myself. I have been doing that in the past and it's just not good. Anita says, what does a burnout look like? It's a very good question. I can just tell you what I know from myself. So myself, how the burnout started is that I started feeling like kind of like a, like a lightning, like a stabbing in my chest. 
And then kind of like a lightheadedness, all of a sudden, like someone just pushed me a bit, like, you know, or like someone gave me a clap in the neck. Um, you get heat waves. I got all of a sudden, all of you just like sweating up um, where I was just like, oh, I can't breathe, right? Breathing problems. Um, problems with sight as well and hearing, beeping in the ear. Um, what else did I have? Yeah, fainting. I had once that I actually fainted in a meeting uh, with the Rockefeller Foundation. It was horrible. And I can share that now. Um, I think I already publicly told, talked about this. I was in a, a meeting with the CEO of the Rockefeller Foundation, Melissa, lovely woman in London. And I already had these signs before, but I was just like, yeah, I will be better again. Let me just lay down. I'm going to be fine. But I never really took care of this and took the time. And that is why I'm saying this. So I was there in the meeting and all of a sudden I felt it coming again, like, <gasps> you know, like the heat and the... <sighs> And that stabbing sensation in my chest, like a lightning hitting, like, like a light bulb, kind of. And I was like, oh, I need the bathroom. And I went into the bathroom and I felt really bad. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, what is happening to me? And I lay on the floor and I put my head, my legs up. And I was just like, I, I'm going to die. My heart really started pounding like crazy. And I felt so ill. I felt like I wanted to throw up. I felt like I wanted to faint. I felt like I couldn't breathe. Like all in one, it was really, really, really extremely unpleasant that I went out and I said to Melissa, and I, I was on medication, antibiotics for some reasons, um, I don't know why, but I was on it. And, and I said to her, hey, I'm on antibiotics and I really feel bad because I thought that was the reason and um, I'm doing a reaction to it. I need to go home. And she's like, no problem. And uh, she said, I understand. I had that before and stuff. And so... I left and I went through the park to go to my house and I called my still husband and now has ex-husband, Louis. And I said to him, I think I'm dying. I said, can you come to the park? I feel so bad and I feel scared to walk by myself because I don't know what is happening to me. And he came and put me on the sofa. And from there on, I had these panic attacks coming more and more and more until I realized, okay, I need to really change something in my life. Something is happening here. And it's not going to change. And um, that's when I started looking into different kinds of therapies and what is happening and symptoms and things like that. So that is what happened to me. And as I said before, it can be different for everyone. It, people can have different things. I know people who have had that sensation of um, fainting and feeling dizzy when driving the car. Uh, you know, it, it depends. And we can talk about it more offline, one-on-one, if some people have some symptoms or feel weird or have questions. And yeah, I happily, I happily make time. So just get in touch with me. As Simone said she had exactly the same symptoms as me. Couldn't sleep. That's as well. Started crying from one moment to the other. Then the bad conscious that you're not able to be there as a mother and as a wife. But you're also just exhausted, right, Simone? You're exhausted with your own body. You're very tired. And one thing as well with my anxiety that I had a lot is that tingling, tingling in my whole body and my hands. I don't know if you had it as well, Simone, but that's when I knew when my hands got cold and tingling, that's when I knew, oh no, there's a panic attack coming up again. Some harder than others, but then I, that's when I knew, okay, something is not right again, right? And it takes time. I remember my girlfriend telling me, Tessie, it's going to take at least four years to fix your nervous system once you broke it the way you did. When I was lying on the sofa and telling her about uh, my experience and how I feel, and she said, yeah, you have a burnout. And she said, it takes years. And I was like, oh my God, no, it's going to be fine, you know? And hey, she was right. And that's why I tell people as well, when I hear this, and I, when people tell me how they feel or when I see it, you know, when I see them shaking and sweating and stuff, I already know what's happening. And I tell them, hey, take care of yourself because this can take years to really heal if you do it the alternative way, right? To really look into what's happening and really trying to fix it without uh, strong medication. Um, so yeah, it takes a long time. It takes a very long time. So prevention, take the time. Because it's easier to fix something that is not broken 
right? Than fixing it when it's really broken. Because if your body shuts down, then it is really broken. Um, there's so many people having burnouts and I'm thankful that you talk about it. It's still not taken serious in our society. No, it doesn't. It does and it doesn't. It's more now also with the pandemic, people talk about it more, to be honest, but it's still frowned upon. You know, let me tell you something. One thing I did and what I talk about a lot is that, you know, we go to the gym, people talk about the well-being of our body, right? We need to eat properly. We need to exercise, right? And um, we need to do mindfulness, right? How about going regularly to a psychologist, right? Once a week, every two weeks, like you would go to the gym, get a subscription as a psychologist, like on an app or with a psychologist. And I talked about that openly in public and people were like, oh my God, she's losing it. She's depressed. It was all in the press. Tessie is depressed um, and what and whatnot. And I was just like, guys, you, you forget the point. You don't get the point. Because, you know, insurances, the, maze, the most amazing business model, we pay them until we're sick. How about we don't pay them anymore if we are sick, right? Because then, and they pay, and they kind of like help us to get these things accessible and or free that keep us healthy, right? Like physiotherapy, massage, um, all kinds of other things. I can't see my people. Lena is joining us. She's here to explore Switzerland a little bit. She's the daughter of a friend. And she's helping me out with Theodor a bit because I'm working on my PhD this month. And I told her um, she went for a walk with Theodor and he's taking a bath now with Papa. I said when she's done, uh, she should join us. So please meet Lena. Hello. She's from Luxembourg. <laughs> so yes, you know, fix things before they get broken. So prevention, prevention, prevention. And, you know, I think health insurance is the, the you know, it's an amazing business deal, dealing with sick people. But I think we should look into the model that, they need to pay us if we get sick, right? Because then they have done something wrong and we pay them while we're healthy so that we can access all of these other things for better reasons, right? To keep healthy. I don't know what the model would be, but it's just a suggestion um, because, yeah, I think we should invest more into our health and that includes mental health and seeing a psychologist and normalize this. Yes, I see a psychologist all the time and I think it's important and I think it is healthy. So there you go. Or life coach, as Anita says, you know, psychologists are called many different ways nowadays because of that stigma attached to it. And if a life coach is what you need and what you like, do it. Oh, Toki has life health insurance that, that works like that. Really? Yes, send it to me. I think that is amazing. I am, see, I'm learning as much as you guys. This is incredible. So they pay you if you get sick. And uh, <laughs> they pay you whenever you're in the hospital overnight. So Rudy says, what I found in Switzerland, at least, is that you have a good GP and tell them that you are stressed and you would like work with a psychologist or psychiatrist. They are usually happy to write you a reference for your insurance. That is true, Rudy but they don't reimburse you for all of it because I see a psychologist here as well and they don't pay everything. Alexander, yes, Chinese model, you pay doctor to keep you in good health. Yeah, exactly. I think it is really, yeah, to just invest more in it, create more prevention methods. I think it's really important. So let's continue because we have anxiety to go through and the meditation which we are running out of time already then when I look at still what I want to get through. So anxiety, this information is retrieved from the myoclinic.org. I'm sure a lot of people know the Mayo Clinic already yeah. and please check it out. If not, they have amazing research and information on their website. And this following information on anxiety is retrieved from there. Experiencing occasional anxiety is a normal part of life. 
However, people with anxiety disorder frequently have intense, excessive, and persistent worry and fear about everyday situation. Often anxiety disorder involves repeated episodes of sudden feelings of intense anxiety and fear, also burnout or terror that reach a peak within minutes, the panic attacks I mentioned to you before. These feelings of anxiety and panic interfere with daily activities are difficult to control are out of proportion to the actual danger and can last a long time. You may avoid places or situations to prevent these feelings. You know, when I had, when my, when my birth, Alexandra, who is laughing there? <laughs> please, please mute yourself. Um, what do you want to say? Um, yes. Ah, there, there you go. Oh, that was Toge. Yeah, exactly. So um, as I was saying before, for me, for example, what I did is I was avoiding going to restaurants with, with friends and family. I couldn't sit there anymore. It was too many people, too close room and everything. That's how bad it was. So whatever it is for you, that is called anxiety and try to take care of that. So symptoms, common anxiety signs and symptoms include feeling nervous, restless, or tense, having a sense of impending danger, panic, or doom, having an increased heart rate, as we talked about with HRV before, um, breathing rapidly, hyperventilation, sweating, trembling, feeling weak or tired, trouble concentrating or thinking about anything other than the present worry, having trouble sleeping, and experiencing gastrointestinal problems, also called GI, having difficulty controlling worry, having the urge to avoid things that trigger anxiety. I have for you several types of anxiety now, so you can see. Agoraphobia. Agoraphobia. Okay, it's a type of anxiety disorder in which you fear and often avoid places or situations that might cause you to panic and make you feel trapped, helpless or embarrassed. Anxiety disorder due to a medical condition includes symptoms of intense anxiety or panic that are directly caused by a physical health problem. Generalized anxiety disorder includes persistent and ex excessive anxiety and worry about activities or events, even ordinary routines issues. The worry is out of proportion to the actual circumstance, is difficult to control and affects how you feel physically. It often occurs along with other anxiety disorders or depression. Panic disorder involves repeated episodes of sudden feelings of intense anxiety and fear or terror that reach a peak within minutes, as we talked about it before. You may have feelings of impending doom, shortness of breath, chest pain, or a rapid fluttering or pounding heart. These panic attacks may lead to worrying about them happening again and avoiding situations in which they have occurred. It's kind of like a devil circle, devil circle, as they say, right? Then you don't want to go there and then you associate that with this and it's just, it's just not good. Separation anxiety disorder is a childhood disorder characterized by anxiety that excessive for the child's development level and relate to separation from parents or others who have parental roles. Societal anxiety disorder, social phobia, involves high levels of anxiety, fear, and avoidance of social situations due to feeling of embarrassing, embarrassment, self-consciousness, and concern about being judged or viewed negatively by others. And that as well, I think, is quite prominent now with social media and all of these other pressures that uh, we have, especially our young people. Specific phobias are characterized by major anxiety when you're exposed to a specific object or situation, like spiders or whatever it is, right? Arachnophobia is it called. There's also phobias for everything. If you Google different types of phobias, there is the most amazing and crazy things coming up. Like people even being having a phobia for cotton, for example, or things like that. Like really, you wouldn't believe it, right? And I'm not making fun of this. This is real. And some people really suffer from it. Just Google it. There's some really, really things you would never imagine. Substance-induced anxiety disorder is characterized by symptoms of an intense anxiety or panic that are directly a result of misusing drugs, taking medications, um, being exposed to a toxic substance or withdrawal from drugs. 
all the specific anxiety disorders and unspecific anxiety disorders are terms for anxiety or phobias that don't meet the exact criteria for any other anxiety disorder, but are significant enough to be distressing and disruptive. Your doctor will tell you. So see a physician and an expert if you need it. Jessica says, I'm scared of butterflies and moths. I get panic attacks and can, and can faint. That is insane, Jessica. I'm so sorry, um, especially in Switzerland. There's butterflies everywhere. Um, yeah, that's crazy. I know I love butterflies. She says, I know you love butterflies. Yes, I do, I do. But um, I'm not sending them your way, I promise. Um, but yes, no, it is, it is really, it is sad, you know, when you have that. Some people have anxieties when it comes to, you know, dogs and cats and hamsters and all kinds of things, right? So yeah, whatever it is, um, I'm sorry. And I hope that you can get over it, that your body can get over it. Interesting. Perfect. Um, so now we have much more medical causes. In some cases, anxiety signs and symptoms are the first indications of a medical illness. If your doctor suspects your anxiety may have medical cause, he or she may order tests to look for, for example, heart disease, diabetes, thyroid problems, such as hyperthyroidism, as I said before, Respiratory disorders such as chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, COPD and asthma, drug misuse or withdrawal, withdrawal from alcohol, anti-anxiety medication, so benzo, benzodiazep, benzo, the people in the US will know what that means, benzodiazepines is a medication or other medication, chronic pain or irritable brow, irritable brow syndrome, rare tumors that occur, that produce as well uh, fight or flight hormones. Sometimes anxiety can be a side effect of certain medication as well. You don't have any blood related relatives such as parents or siblings with an anxiety disorder. Um, you didn't have an anxiety disorder as a child. You don't avoid certain things or situations because of anxiety and so on. Risk factors, very shortly because we need to move on. Trauma, stress due to an illness, stress build up from an event or something else, a death in the family. Personality, people with certain personality types are more prone to anxiety. Other mental health disorders, um, having blood relatives with an anxiety disorder. Anxiety disorder can run in families. Drug or drugs or alcohol. And um, yeah, there's another section, but let me tell you the prevention section that she mentions. Get help early. So anxiety, like many other mental health conditions, can be harder to treat if you wait. Stay active, participate in activities that you enjoy and that make you feel good, as we talked about many, many times. Avoid alcohol or drug abuse. So um, the resources that we are talking about quickly um, are... I found actually, if you Google it, you find all of them. I will go through, let's say two. I have actually a few that I wanted to do, but I will do two and the rest you find on geekflare.com just because we don't have time. Uh, so geekflare, G-E-E-K-F-L-A-R-E.com, medication slash medication hyphen gadget hyphen apps. And there you find the most amazing tools, technological tools to use for all kinds of things, for mental health, uh, heart rate variability, and so on. There's an app called Aura, A-U-R-A. Become better at controlling your emotions and getting good sleep while also improving your overall self with the Aura app. No matter if you're having a great day, feeling stressed out, or can't sleep, you can join millions of other users, instantly feel a lot relaxed and better than before. Um, upon entering a few details, yeah, you can have it. And you can, it has also thousands of empowering audio tracks, gratitude journals, natural sounds, and music, which is amazing. Then we have Leaf Urban. It's a gorgeous piece of jewelry that can help you track a healthy lifestyle. 
informs you about habits, goals, and milestones while being a fashionable element that complements your style. It can track activity, sleep, meditation, stress, and reproductive health efficiency. So it's very good for women as well to track your cycle. It doesn't have a screen or any buttons, and you can wear it to a shower as well as it's water resistant. It looks actually pretty cool. It looks like a little leaf, like a bracelet on your arm. We have Muse, which is this, which I have. There you go. Muse. Oops. All right, so it's a fancy box. So there's a box here. And it looks like this. You put it on. Oops. It looks like this. You look a bit like Spocky, you know, from Star Wars. Spocky. Um, and it kind of like, as you can see here, it tracks your brain waves. So while you meditate with the Muse app, it tracks, um, it shows you your brain waves and how they respond, which I think is really amazing. And what is really great, it gives you direct feedback. So if you are not in a state of relaxation, it actually goes from the birds, which are alpha state, the wind or whatever surrounding sound you have chosen, the park, the lake, the forest or whatever, or park, it gets louder. So you know you need to calm yourself down. So you get direct feedback and you need to breathe and calm yourself in order to do so, which I think is amazing. What helped with the muse for me is that um, I didn't know my body and my brain were not connected. That's why I had these panic attacks. So actually by using the muse, I realized that I felt most panicked when the birds were chirping which is so counterintuitive, isn't it? Because the muse, when the birds chirp, you actually in relaxation. So my body confused me being relaxed by actually being stressed. The second I realized that, the panic attacks were almost all gone. So it is a really great, great device. It helped me a lot. So go on the Geek uh, website to find all of the others. Then of course I have this, which I love. When I breastfeed at night, I color. There you go. So, well, any kind of coloring book. There you go. And crayons, good old times. Works. And you find it in every bookshop, really. You really do. It's great. So I do that. And what is really nice as well is this. Thank you, Lena. It hurts. Yes, it does sometimes. But it is amazing. And it actually forces your body and especially your tense muscles in the back to relax. If you want it or not, it will make you want it. <laughs> so the first minute or two can be a little bit uncomfortable. Then it gets it gets a bit, let me take off the, the blur so you can see. There you go. So it looks like this inside here, it doesn't want to come out. You see it here, you see the noppies? So it is a um, it is a mat, and it's it's kind of like a relaxation mat, like a um, how would you call it? What well, it says here, hashtag do your fitness. So um, where did I buy this? I bought this at Whole Foods actually, but I know the brand now. But if you do um, acupuncture mats, you find them on Amazon everywhere, and they have also different strengths. Uh, some have more noppies, others are uh, the noppies are bigger. I have the the more intense one, and it really after two three minutes on this, my whole body it's like butter in a pan. It's like yeesh. the body just lets go, and I I get goosebumps and I get so relaxed. Often I fall asleep. So um, try this; it's amazing, especially in the evening before you go to bed. It's fantastic. So that's with all of the tools. Now, let me see. I have a big meditation of half an hour, but we don't have time. And I have a small one, which is of five minutes, which I found um, at thecoachingtoolscompany.com. De-stress series, relax clients in under five minutes, guided meditation scripts. So that's where I found it. And it's a very short one, five minutes, as I said, and we're going to do this. Um, you have that too. Do you, you're talking about the mat or the muse, Jessica? 
the first one you you call it um aura that's the app um, aura then we have muse headband i put it in the chat quickly then we have uh acupuncture mat and then try it it's really great aura ring um there's another thing actually which i'm trying now which i bought which is it was really expensive let me not lie to you guys it was so expensive and it made me a bit upset but i think it's going to be really really good and i'm really excited about it it's called brain tap brain tap tech and the device itself costs around six hundred dollars which I think is really expensive, but it has light therapy and sound therapy while it also has different types of guided meditations and all kinds of things. And it has a wellness package, which you pay $29 a month on top, but it has everything. It has health, it has stress, it has worry, it has fear, it has children section as well. And you can use it up to on two devices for five people. So for me, I invested in it because I thought it's good for the whole family. We are, you know, Julia, Gabriel, Noah, Frank, and me. Theodore is not doing it yet. So I think it, it was worth it for me to do it now. And I will try it. As soon as I have it, I will put it in our class. And we're going to try it together. I will show you the whole thing because I think it's pretty cool. Um, so that is called, just to repeat, Brain Tap. Again, I'm not paid for any of this. This is just suggestions and I'm not advertising. I'm just telling you what worked for me and what I'm trying. Um, so just information for you to use if you want. So the big meditation we can't do, but we can do the small guided meditation for stress relief to finish up. So if you're ready, as always, um, turn your camera off if you like, or have it on, whatever you want. And... Um, I will guide you through this meditation. And you can relax and just do what I tell you. <laughs> uh, so, try to bring yourself to a place of stillness. Find a position you are comfortable in and begin to breathe deeply. As we already learned in the last few weeks, breathe in to the count of four, one, two, three, four, and breathe out to the count of six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Continue to breathe and count for another two breath cycles. As you breathe, I would like you to pay attention to what thoughts are coming up. Don't start thinking about them. Don't let yourself get caught up. Just notice them and continue to breathe. I want you to visualize these thoughts like fish in an ocean or as we heard before, a koi in the pond in your garden. Each thought is a tiny minnow. As you continue breathing and you can go to your natural rhythm of breathing, stop controlling it, just let it happen. I would like you to zoom out a little and see the part of the ocean this minnows are in, the little fish. Your thoughts, right? Are they in the middle of the ocean or close to shore? 
What is the water like? Are there waves or is the ocean still? What time is it outside? Not forgetting to breathe. I would like you to zoom out even further until you can see the entirety of the ocean until you could trace its outline with a crayon. What shape is the ocean? And what do you see around it? Are these islands in this ocean? And what does it look like from afar? Keep breathing. As you zoom out even further, I want you to bring your attention to the planet on which this ocean is. Is it Earth or perhaps some alien planet? What colors does it have and how big is the ocean from here? As you zoom out even further, I want you to bring your attention. I want you to imagine the galaxy of this planet. Is it big? Is it small, bright or dull? And what is it its name? What name would you give it? Your ocean with your thoughts, with your little fish in it, on the earth or the planet, all the way out in the galaxy, like a little, like a little ball, like, you know, like man in black, the cat that had the galaxy around the neck, right? Size doesn't matter. It's the deepness. How deep does it go for you? And what would you call it? What is the galaxy of your mind? How do you call it? When you have the name of the galaxy on the tip of your tongue, I want you to gently open your eyes, wiggle with your toes and your fingers, and breathe in and out one more time to the count of four in. And to the count of six out. This concludes our little guided meditation for today for stress relief. I hope you liked it. I think it is a really nice, con well, it's a nice continuation of the visualization exercise we did last week when we talked about all visualization. For the people who have missed it, please go and watch week four. You find it on my YouTube channel, Tessie Anthony de Nassau, um, on YouTube. And there you find all of the last five weeks sessions. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Anita. She says a great session. I hope, you know, it's always so condensed and so packed in, right? Because there's so much information and I want you really to get the most out of it when you're already spending time with me in precious time, right? I really want to make it as informative and interesting as possible. There's so many other things, right? This is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many things you can Google and learn and read about and find out. So please keep being curious 
And this is just the beginning, a teaser of the things you can explore if you want. Uh, Simone says, thank you very much for this interesting meeting to you and all participants. Quite lucky to be part of this. I stopped drinking coffee. I'm reading the Why We Sleep book. We'll participate in many workshops of the topic mindfulness in September. IFEN, the institute that offers trainings to teachers. I was surprised how many they offer right now. And I'm sure I will look for the alcohol-free beer on Sunday when I be in Switzerland, but I will not start to smoke. That is very great, Simone. And yes, Switzerland has so many alcohol-free beer brands and it's delicious. Um, so Aza, thank you so much. You're very welcome. To everyone, um, as every week, I will uh, stop the recording in a second um, so that you can ask your questions uh, in the comfort of our group here. And if you have any other questions, you can reach out to me directly as always. Um, next week will be week six. I don't have my paperwork with me right now and we didn't have time for the exercise. So please do the exercise that I have sent to you. Um, and uh, we will go for it next week. And we'll take more time for the exercise next week and another exercise I will send you. And uh, for the ones tuning in on YouTube or um, any other channels, please, if you want the exercise, just write me and I will send it to you. Rudy, thank you, Tessie, for the great session. Thank you all for sharing your experience and the wonderful tips anytime. So this is it concluding today. We see each other next week, Thursday, 7 p.m. CET as every week for week six. So four more weeks to go, guys. Well, we have four more weeks of intense sessions and then we have a wrap-up session, as you know. Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, life-changing book of Dr. Joe Dispenser. Alexandra says, I agree. Yes, Anita, we can do that. I will write you in private. And Toki, thank you, Tassie. This was very furl. For, for, yeah, furl. Thank you. I am so glad. So I will stop the recording now. Everyone, thank you so much and see you next week. Let me do this. How can I do it? Oh, here we go.